awesome. Well, uh, we began last week to talk about, I think, one of the most important things we can talk about, which is how important it is to learn to be content. And we landed with this truth, and this is our first point today, that the secret, how big of a deal is this, the secret to true peace in our lives comes from learning to be content. And not just learning to be content, learning to be content regardless of our circumstances. And we said last week that in the Bible, God says, I want to give you this new peace, no matter what you go through, this peace that passes all understanding. And God wants to give you that, but you're not going to experience that if you don't learn to be content. And I hope you're like me. Every Christmas season, I want to do better spiritually. I want to grow closer to God. I want to get it better spiritually myself with God and as a family. You're not going to do that if you don't learn to be content. And above all, my dream would be God's done a miracle in my life and saved our marriage and put our family back together. But I want to end someday old sitting on a patio with my wife saying, man, honey, that was a pretty good ride we had. And you're going to miss that if you don't learn how to be content. Such a big deal. One of the things that contentment does that we don't talk about enough, and this is a great thing to study, is contentment brings us joy. Joy. I wonder if you've ever studied or thought about what a big deal joy is. I had a mentor teach me what a big deal joy was. Um, One time I was venting, and God has used this man to teach me so much in life. One time I was venting to this guy who's a mentor to mine, and and he listened. He's a great listener. And then he said, a couple things, Mike, I want to share with you. First of all, remember this as I was venting about a tough season of life. He said, whatever you go through in life is an opportunity for you to grow and change. No matter how bad it is or how tough it is, God's wanting to do something in you, and this is an opportunity for you to grow and change. Never forget that, and that, that's a powerful word. And then he, the scripture we're going to talk about in Philippians, and he said, remember, change your thoughts. Whatever is good, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. The secret to this abundant life, you got to learn to change your thoughts, Mike, and the Bible's clear about that. And then he said, remember where your joy comes from. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, you know where your joy comes from, right? And I'm like, uh, you know. And he goes, where does your joy come from? And I'm like, uh, Jesus? Because you got a 50-50 chance of getting it right if you throw out Jesus. Maybe more than 50, right? Jesus? And he showed me Nehemiah 8.10, and it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. He said, never forget that, Mike. Whatever you go through, you have this inner strength, and it comes from the joy of the Lord, and you got to learn to walk in that joy. So point number two, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and here's where joy comes from. It comes through the Lord's provision, and it remains in a heart of contentment. So first of all, what is our strength? The joy of the Lord is our strength, and then the joy comes through the Lord's provision. So you're not going to get it from stuff, although we think we will. We look for stuff or money or toys or anything, pills, whatever. No, it comes from God. What we're really looking for is joy, and it remains in a heart of contentment. There's a daily meditation that I read called 24 Hours a Day, and October 16th says something. And when I heard this, I'm like, that is so powerful to me. Here's a line in this daily meditation, October 16th. When your heart's right, your world's right. I'm like, wow, that is powerful. If your heart's not right, your world's not going to be right. You can go through all life, and if your heart's not right, you're going to miss it. So we have to learn to get our heart right. Your heart will never be right if you're not walking and learning to be content. So joy of the Lord is our strength, and joy comes through the Lord's provision and remains in a heart of contentment. Let me share a real quick Last week, we looked at some definitions of contentment. I want to talk about where this word comes from. I found this interesting in my studies uh, this week, that the word contentment comes from the root word for county, like Clark County, Miami County, Montgomery County, county. And originally, now remember, when the counties were laid out, it was a different world. Are we aware of that? I mean, they didn't have cars like we have, and everything was different. So transportation was different, and it was a way bigger deal to go to another county. Makes sense. And a county was originally, this is my understanding, the idea was a self-sustaining landmass. 
So everything was here self-sustaining, and we don't need any imports because our county is self-sustaining. So you have county seat and things like that. So when Paul says, I've learned the secret to be content, he's saying, I don't need anything else. I have all I need. And we as followers of Christ need to remember, if we have four things, we have all we need, and we don't need anything else, and God has given us these things. These things will make you feel content, and they're a gift from God. The first thing we have is the Word of God. We have the Word of God, and, and this is the most powerful thing we have. And the key is, when God says we have the Word of God, the Bible says to put it in our hearts and memorize it and meditate on it and learn the Word of God. It's interesting, the original Bible is through oral tradition. They memorized and learned the Word of God before the printing press, and we don't do enough of that. So we have the Word of God, and that doesn't mean that, that we have that on a bookshelf that's dusty in some room in our house. We put it in our hearts so we can meditate and say out loud the power of the Word of God. We also have, do you know this, the Son of God. Where? In our heart. The Holy Spirit of God is living. The Trinity is living in our heart. The Son of God is with us. We also have, and this is one of the biggest gifts, I hope you don't miss this, the people of God. We have a whole new family, a whole new God family that is awesome. And part of finding true life is to do life with this new family. Church shouldn't be just a place you come. We want you to get involved and get in a small group and do life with your new family, and it's awesome. It's awesome for your kids. It's awesome for your family. Don't, don't miss that. And then the fourth thing is we get to be engaged in the purposes of God. We have a whole new purpose for living. So many people I've seen come alive in this church, and they're like, thank you. And it's like, what for? It's like, you helped me to be fully alive, to discover my real purpose in life, to live for God. And that's the purpose for all of us. So we, we have those four things. Now, today, we're going to turn a corner, and here's what we're going to do. My water was pretty full there. Uh, we're going to, uh, that's a long story, why that, why that water's full. I'm not going to go into it, all right? Um, we're going to talk about four areas, top four areas where we need to learn to be content. And when I began this idea, uh, this was two weeks ago, and this is where I want to start. It took me a week and a half to get here. But these are the top four areas where we need to learn to be content. As we go through these, I hope you'll look at your life. What are your growth areas? Maybe talk about these on the way home. Certainly you want to share these with your children and grandchildren and anyone else that's wrestling in this area. There's so much to this truth from God. So the first area, I must learn to be content where I am. I must learn to be content where I am. I love what I'm going to say next. We have Paul, who was this incredible follower of Christ, who at one time didn't want anything to do with this, but he got knocked off his donkey and discovered Jesus and was never the same. And Paul says, I can do all things through Christ and twi twice in the scripture. I've learned the secret. The secret is to be content. Here's the amazing thing. Do you know where Paul was when he said this? He was locked up in prison. Boy, he wasn't a hypocrite. He's locked up sharing the good news saying, I want to share this with all of you. I've learned the secret. And he was locked up in prison when he said this. This is awesome. So we must learn to be content where we are. I'm going to make a couple confessions to you today. My first confession is this. Um, no judgment here, but I'm just, and, and the older I get, the more I wrestle with this. I hate winter, all right? I hate it. I hate winter. Uh, I, I hate fall because around the corner is winter, <laughs> right? Man, it, and, and it bothers me. How many of you agree and you hate winter? Raise your hand. It's less every, so this is about 60%. How many of you actually love winter? I really don't even understand. I like really don't, I like it just makes no sense to me at all. Maybe if you could visit a place that had winter for a day or two and that's it. And like once in your life, not even every year. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I looked this up. I hate winter. Spring in 2019 begins March 20th. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> That's a long way away. 
Now, if all I do between now and March 20th is complain and wait for spring, then I'm going to miss a big chunk of quality of life I'm supposed to engage in. See? So we need to learn to be content where we are. And, and the Bible says no matter what's going on, remember, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad. And every day you got to seize the day. No matter what season you're in, spring, summer, winter, and fall, seize the day. But no matter what season in life you're in, you have to seize the day as well. Whether you're in a bad place and maybe going through a divorce, whether you're grieving, whether you just got a medical report and you're in for a long ride, no matter what's going on in your season of life, life still goes on. You've got to learn to live every day to the fullest and seize the day and learn to be content every day. This is the secret to living this gift of life that God gave you. Every day we must learn to be content where we are. Now, another confession, and this is so true. My wife was here last night. She was just cracking up because she remembers the moment this happened. I love, I hate winter, I love Laguna Beach. Has anybody ever been to Laguna Beach? Oh, boy. I've been to Laguna Beach, I think, twice, and me and my wife just sat and looked at Laguna Beach, and I had an emotional affair with Laguna Beach. I cheated on this church. I had an affair, and my mind went to, oh, maybe I could be a pastor at Laguna Beach. And, and my mind just started spinning. I'm like, well, the heyday of the church was the 50s, especially in California, and they would have had parsonages for pastors, and they're not dumb. So if that was on the beach before California exploded, maybe I could get a gig here and live in a house on the beach for free. And it'd be 70 degrees every day, and I'm like packing my bags. My wife remembers this. I mean, I'm like talking to her about it. I apologize for cheating on you. And, and, and the, the problem is, I'm not called to be there. I'm called to be here. And if I would act on my feelings, I would set myself up for a big mistake in life. That's why we don't act on our feelings. And we're always going to wrestle with our feelings. And some place may look a little better. And somebody else may look a little better. And the grass may always look a little greener. But the secret to life is to learn to be content where you are. It's a huge secret to life, learning to be content uh, where you are. Now, listen, we actually live in a great part of the country. You just got to look at it that way. We have all four seasons. That's beautiful. We're an hour's drive from some incredible cities, Cincinnati and Columbus. We're a day's drive from Chicago and New York and the Smoky Mountains and all kinds of incredible stuff. You know, um, I have never, I'm born and raised in Vandalia. I'm, I'm still in Vandalia. I have never been in fear for my life from the big one, the big earthquake that's supposed to hit Dayton, Ohio. I've never been in fear for my life. I've never had to board up the house because hurricane whatever is, gonna, is coming right towards, that's never on the news. The hurricane's never going to hit my house. And I don't have forest fire issues. And, and, and above all, I live less than an hour away from the Ohio State University. I could have been born in Michigan. I just want to take one second and sneak that in there. And, 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 and I, I didn't even believe the best. I wrote this message different. I wrote it originally. I did not think this was going to go well. And I wrote it as every squirrel gets a nut once every seven years. But I didn't need to use it. So I'm going to get right back into the message and stay there. And that's pretty healthy for me, all right? So it was just awesome. So, All right. Uh, we need to learn to be content where we are. We really do. A huge thing to being content is humility. Pride comes before the fall. Humble yourselves before the Lord, the Bible says, and he will lift you up. And see, we think, well, I deserve more, and I need more. I have a bigger house, more toys, more this, more that, more, more, more. And that's, that's not the secret to life. The secret is to learn to be content. This includes, it's very important, 
If you hang around here long enough, I think you're going to discover we really do love you and care about you. This, this includes the church. It is so important to find a church you love and grow roots there and begin to serve there and begin to be part of the church, especially if you're married, if you're in a serious relationship, if you have children, if you have family that are willing to be at church with you, find a church, an awesome Bible-believing church, and, and grow some roots there and, and be committed and be part of what God's doing there. And don't every three or four years move around because if you do that, you're going to miss part of the beauty. It takes years to get to know people, years to develop a new God family. And that's some of the beauty is when you've been together with people. And, and so, man, I want to see you. And we're here to help you. If this isn't the right church for you, then I'm really, we're here to help you. But I want to see you grow roots and soar for God and see your family love that and look forward to that. And, and I don't want you to miss that. It's it's so important. It really is. So I hope you'll get started serving and, and, and apply that to your life. It's been the biggest blessing ever. So must learn to be content where I am. Second thing, I wonder if you could guess what these four are. Second thing, I must learn to be content with what I do. Anybody ever know anyone that calls himself a follower of Christ and, and you hear this from them about their job? I hate my job. <laughs> I don't want to go to work today. I can't stand that place. I can't stand my boy. I hate my job. Oh, what kind of witness is that? Right? It's like, whoa. Um, if I just had a better job, that's my problem. No. Your problem is kind of an attitude in learning to be content with your job. Uh, there's a verse in the Bible, and we're going to look at a few of these today. You can tell that I didn't write the Bible because I wouldn't have put this verse in there. But that's what I love about the Bible. God put all the verses in there that I need to apply to my life. So this is certainly one. Philippians 2. And let's be a church that holds each other accountable with these passages of Scripture. Here's what it says. Hey, do everything without complaining or arguing. Everything. Do everything without complaining or arguing. And you know why? It says because this is going to affect your witness. You're supposed to be a follower of Christ. You're supposed to, supposed to be grateful for all that God's given you, so do everything. Uh, Colossians 3, 17 says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him for everything. we got to learn to be content with whatever we do. If you, whatever it is, learn to be content. And here's a huge nugget that I believe more than anything. Whatever you do, and if that's if you stay at home with your kids, or if you're a painter, or if you're in landscaping, whatever you do, or if you're a doctor, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, trust that you're there for a reason, and God's wanting to grow in you and do something in you and through you. Wherever you're at, trust that. You're there for a reason. Um, share a story with you. It's a very powerful thing for me, and uh, it's kind of special for me to talk about this weekend. So I came here because my wife left me and God did a miracle and restored our marriage and I called him fire for Jesus and God called me to be a pastor, which is crazy. So here I am just called to be a pastor, no experience and <laughs> nobody will give me an opportunity. But I am so called, I would do anything to be a pastor, anything. And there was no opportunities. Well, at the church where uh, I found Christ, my mentor, this, this position opened up and my mentor was filling the position. So I'm like, well, this is incredible. I had done pretty well uh, corporately, so I'm like, um, I kind of assume they're going to hire me, right? Because in my head, I'm pretty awesome. Remember, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So I'm like, they're going to hire me. And, and um, so I applied, and I, you know, I had prepared and showed up and thought I interviewed well, and I'm just waiting on the phone call. Yep, you're it. And my mentor called me, and he said, I'm sorry, Mike, we're not going to hire you. What? And he said, we're going to hire another guy named Bill. <laughs> Bill? Who's Bill? And I'm ticked off. I'm ticked off at God. I'm ticked off at this Bill dude. And I'm ticked off at my mentor. And, you know, it was a process. Now, I'm in engineering. I'm so called. But luckily, I was humble enough that, okay, somehow I'm going to keep going and trust you. And keep growing spiritually and stay on fire and trust God's got something for me. And just keep plugging. But, man, I was, I was really upset about this. I really was. I was, I was questioning things. Um, a year or two later, there was this little dying church in Medway. And, 
They couldn't find anybody to take the gig, and God parted the seas and made a way for me to be the pastor of the church. And it was about 70 people. And God began to do a miracle, and people started coming to our church. And, and about a year or two into this, guess what happened? Bill came to our church. <laughs> so I'm like, I hope he's visiting because I don't like Bill because Bill got the job, and so I had some issues. So Bill wasn't visiting. So Bill and his wife start coming to church every week, and it's weird. And God took me to the woodshed in a, in a way I'll, I'll never forget. Um, God speaks through other people. He'll speak through you if you let him. God speaks through people all the time. And so church is over. I still remember this. And I talked to Bill last night. He remember, I have a visual, and so does he. Church is over. And he goes, Mike, can I talk to you for a minute? It's like, sure, Bill. Um, um, and we're leaning over the little thing on the steps at the old church. And he goes, Mike, um, I don't know if you remember. Do you remember when I got that job and you didn't? <laughs> yeah, Bill. I remember that. I'm still kind of ticked off about it, to be honest with you, Bill. I, I totally remember. We'd never talked about it. I did tell him. I go, yeah. Yeah, I ticked off about it. Mike, don't you see? <laughs> see what, Bill? Don't you see that if you would have got that job, you might not be here now. And you're my pastor now. Don't you get it, Mike? And I was like, whoa. I might have missed everything. God was working, but I had to trust that wherever I was, I had to be content and continue to grow and trust that God is preparing me for something. And wherever you're at, use this as an opportunity that God is preparing you for something. And grow and be content. Don't miss it. So important. So, must learn to be content with what I do. I hope every day, would you practice this? How about this in this season of life that, that whatever you do, thank God every day for it. Just every morning, thank God. Thank you, God, for what I get to do. If you stay home with your kids, thank you, God. I would say get a babysitter and get away from them occasionally. I didn't plan on saying that, but I would tell you that. But thank you, God. Whatever you do, thank God for your job. It's a blessing. If you have a place to lay your head on a pillow at night, thank God. Thank God for the little things. you got to live that way. It changes everything. Next, I must learn to be content with what I have. I wrestle with this one more than this is my, on the way home on my talk, this would be the one I wrestle with the most. This idea is throughout the Bible. God's trying to teach us this truth. Uh, Matthew says, seek first his kingdom. Don't miss this, and everything else will make sense. Everything else will be, don't miss seeking first his kingdom. I love, there's this parable about the rich fool, and he was blessed, and God blessed him and gave him crops, and what did he do? I'm just going to keep building bigger barns, more stuff. It's all about me, more stuff, more stuff. And his life ended a little quicker than he thought. And he missed everything. And he's referred to as the rich fool. It's not about stuff. It's not about bigger barns. It's about using your life to help and bless others and change the world. And what about this in Luke? Watch out. Watch out. When the Bible says watch out, you should watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And you know what we do? We wrestle with that. Really? Really, God? I don't know. But deep down, we know it's not about our stuff. And the secret is to learn to be content. We must learn to be content with what we have. I will never forget this happened to me. Um, I was uh, young and in engineering, and I'd gotten sober, and my boss promoted me to project manager, and he mentored me and taught me a lot about life. He took me on this marketing call. And we went to an up-and-coming developer who has turned into a huge developer, very successful firm. And we went to visit them in their office, and it was a big, fancy office tower. And I'd never been in a spread like this. We walked in his office, and I'm like, whoa, this is the life. Everything was very impressive. His travel was impressive. What he drove was impressive. His whole life, his whole gig was just unbelievably impressive to me. And we left, and... Luckily, we got some work, and it was a great working relationship with this company and this man. But on the way out, all I was, I was like a little kid in a candy store, and my boss, I was like, whoa, 
that's my dream to have an office like that. I want to be like that. I want to have all that stuff that guy's got. Don't you want that? His name was Keith. Don't you want that, Keith? And he goes, honestly, Mike, I'm pretty good. I'm like, what? You don't want an office like that and all that? He goes, well, what, what does he have I don't have, Mike? He has an office. I have an office. His office may be a little bigger, a little fancier, but it's just an office. He has a wife and kids. I have a wife and kids, and I love, and they mean the world to me, and I'm trying to get that right. He really doesn't have anything I don't have, Mike. And I'm just like, that's weird. What it was was he knew the secret to life. The secret is to learn to be content with what you have. And ironically, I think God honors that and blesses that. Now, he's one of the vice presidents of a huge company, and it's not surprising, and I'm sure he's still just content. God honored that. What a mentor. I get to call him coming up to thank him for what he did for me. I always call him on my sobriety day. Must learn to be content with what I have. If you think a new car, a new house, a new motorcycle will make you feel more content, no. In fact, it may work against you. So we're getting ready to wrap this up and head into our Christmas series. I hope above all that, that this has spoken to you, at least these, these three points. This message helps you and your family and will teach, teach you to be content, that you'll teach that to your children, to your grandchildren. This is such a huge thing, especially in today's instant gratification world. The secret is so powerful to learning to be content. Last area is for everyone, but especially, but it really is for everyone, especially married people. If you're married, ra raise your hand. It's a lot of you. Here's the last point. I must learn to be content with who I'm with. Now, if you're single, this may be a more important point for you. If you're single, then you must learn to be content with who you're with, which is you. And if you're waiting for someone else to come along to complete you, to make life make sense, you're probably never going to have a healthy relationship. As soon as you learn to be content with just you and you and God, that's probably when God, if it's his will, will pop the right person in your life. But the secret is to learn to be content with who you're with. And if you're married, man, this is so important to your marriage. It's so important to your family, learning to be content with who you're with. June 20th, 1992, um, I made a covenant before God. I stood there in front of a pastor, and I said, I take this woman, no matter what, to be my wife. Now, when I did that, I didn't know that was a covenant before God. I didn't understand these things. When I became a Christian, I'm like, oh, that was a covenant before God. <laughs> Whoa. And I decided I'm going to do my very best to honor that covenant no matter what. The problem is, we could be miserable the rest of our lives, but I'm going to do my best to honor that covenant no matter what. So how do we learn to not be miserable? How do we learn to have a beautiful marriage? How do we learn to get this right? Well, huge secret is learning to be content, learning to appreciate how good you've got it. I see people right now, arm in arm. If you're sitting with somebody in church that you love, do you know how lucky you are? Do you know what a blessing it is to be able to come to church together as a family? Do you know how good you've got it? It's such a blessing. Got to learn to be content with who you've got. So some people, sometimes there's a, a husband and he says things, if you were just a better wife, if you would just grow up, if you would just get it together, then my life would be complete. No, it wouldn't. Not until you learn to be content will your life be complete. And sometimes there's a wife and she doesn't do it on purpose, but she pushes, pushes. If you would just grow and change, if you would just do this, if you would just provide this, if you would just, it drives a hole, a wedge in that marriage. And no, you've got to learn to be content with who you're with. That's the secret. One more verse of scripture that I really wish wasn't in there. This is one I wrestle with more than anything, Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up 
according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. How are you doing on getting that right in your family? Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Just build the people up you love the most. Build them up. Build your spouse up. Build your spouse up. So I'm going to confess something to you. Please don't judge me, all right? I'm just confessing the truth to you, trying to make a point. And some of you are guilty of the same thing. For many years, I would say to my wife, well, honey, you better get it together. I'm going to trade you in for a younger model with more plastic. That's what I'm going to do, honey. You better get it together. And I stand before you today saying there has been hundreds of times I've thought about trading her in. I'm so glad I didn't trade her in. I'm so glad. And that poor woman of God has probably had thousands of times she thought about trading me in. And I'm so glad she didn't trade me in. It's worth it. It's hard work, but it's worth it. And the key is to learn to be content and make God the foundation and grow in Christ and let the fruit of the Spirit come in your life. And it's going to be crazy hard work, but God will do a miracle if you will let him and make him the foundation of your marriage. We're going to wrap this up in just a second. Thursday was Thanksgiving. It was my 51st turkey day. If I did the math right. So I like to think, and this is glass half full kind of thing, I'm about halfway done on turkey days. Some of you are like, no, bro, I think you're about three quarters. <laughs> I like to be optimistic. The point is, is this, this journey goes by pretty quick. My oldest son's 26. I'm like, he's a quarter of the way done on turkey days. Man, this thing go, goes by quick. Thanksgiving, 51st, after third service today, I'm going to go to a funeral for a 55-year-old lady. That's only four more turkey days. Wow. Lady I love in this church, love. I got a phone call and she's going to be battling cancer. I'm praying for her. Life is short. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. All we can do is seize the day. Final point. Every single day is an opportunity. Every day is a gift to persevere, to live for something bigger than yourself, and to be content. You got to learn to be content where you are, with what you do, with what you have, and with who you're with. It's the secret to life. Every day, opportunity, persevere, live for something bigger than yourself, and be content. So the night before Thanksgiving, my son called me. I love it when he calls. He said, I'm going to run the turkey trot tomorrow. Isn't that great? And I'm like, not really. Everything I got hurts. I don't care if you run that thing or not. He goes, it's five miles. I'm hoping to beat 35 minutes. And I'm, again, I'm like, cool, whatever. It's Thanksgiving, and I'm on my spinner bike, Kate and Life, watching the parade. And my son texts me, guess what? I did 33.45. I'm like, big deal. I'm dying. I'm 51. I'm dying on a spinner bike. Who cares? That's not the attitude of Christ. I'm telling you right now, that's not the heart of God. I felt convicted. It's my son I love. And he's reaching out to me. And this is my son who about died when he was young. And he's graduated from college. And like a lot of people, he went through the, the freshman 15 thing and so on. And he's fighting for his health. He's in the best shape of his life. And I'm, I'm like, you go, son. Run your race every day. Run your race. That's the heart of God. And God's telling all of us, life is a gift. Run your race. Persevere. Live for something bigger than yourself. That's my son. It's like, don't, son. No matter how much God blesses you professionally, no matter how much God blesses you, don't make it about stuff. The secret is to be content with what you've got and live for something bigger than yourself. That's the secret, son. And I don't want him to miss that. And I don't want any of you to miss that. And I hope we grow in this area from now all the way to heaven. Let's, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father God, teach us, help us to learn to be content, to be grateful for all you've given us. If we are in Christ, all of our sins are washed away. That's enough. 
thank you for Jesus, for life more abundantly that we can know we're going to heaven and you can know that right now. Right now in your heart, you can just say, God, this is my time. If you haven't made this official, God, forgive me for my sins right now. God, we want to follow you. We want to grow and change. We want you to do a work in our lives and our families. We want to teach your truths to our children. Generations will be changed. We love you and praise you. May we apply this to our lives, and we thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.